Washington Grown is brought to you by the Potato Farmers of Washington. Learn why Washington is home to the world's most productive potato fields and farmers by visiting potatoes.com. And by the Washington State Department of Agriculture, supporting the viability and vitality of Washington agriculture. And by Northwest Farm Credit Services, supporting agriculture and rural communities with reliable, consistent credit and financial services today and tomorrow. Hi everyone, I'm Christy Gordon, and welcome to Washington Grown. We all depend on farmers and the workers like you see here in this cucumber field to produce the food we eat. Here in rural Washington, farmers and ranches are pulling double duty. In this episode, we're going to learn about some of the ways that agriculture is supporting the local economy. I'm picking cucumbers at a vegetable farm in Yakima. Does she need to pick up the pace a little bit? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I'm making green curry at Dubali Asian Bistro in Airway Heights. Go get it, Mama Jeannie. Try my best. <laughs> We're almost there. And Val's visiting Angar Corporation, a creator and manufacturer of fruit processing equipment in Whatcom County. They're able to process more berries per hour with less labor. All this and more today on Washington Grown. When you're as short as I am. Come and see Christy sheep. sheep. <laughs> <Ta -da. laughs> it's like I can taste the sunshine. Cheers. Bring it in. Bring it in. Oh. The There's calories are adding up. No calories in this. You don't get to do this every day. Here in Airway Heights, near Spokane, you don't have to go too far to find authentic Southeast Asian cuisine. Dibali Asian Bistro is bringing guests a special experience of great food and, of course, a whole lot of love. Definitely homemade, homegrown. Extremely flavorful. Just really unique ingredients. It's delicious. And the smells just make you hungry. Dibali Asian Bistro, it is my long lifetime dreams. Owner Jeannie Choi, or as everyone calls her, Mama Jeannie, wants her guests to feel special, like they just walked into her home kitchen. I moved to the United States, uh, far away from my families and my loved ones. So when I start to get a cooking inside of my kitchen, I always make for the, what makes me happy and uh, remind my home. I shared those kind of food with my friends and family. So Diwali Asian Bistro is dishes coming from the loving heart. I would say a couple times a month we come and then we also get it to go home. They seem homemade, which is nice. I would definitely come back. It's a lot of work, but it also a lot of fun. I am very appreciative of all our customers. They coming in here regularly or unregularly. I am very happy to uh, customers are walking this door. Yeah. Everybody welcome in here. Later in the show, Mama Jeannie and I make green curry. Stick around. That's a morning workout, Chris. Yeah, I'm already breaking a sweat. <laughs> Here on the Yakima Valley Reservation, we're visiting Inava Farms, a large family-owned operation where throughout the active season, Lon Inaba and his workers produce a wide variety of veggies that we often eat in our homes. We grow, pack, and ship a wide variety of what I call miscellaneous chop suey vegetables. These are table cukes. Here, this is where it sat on the ground. Right. That's why it's it's yellow. Yeah. Didn't get the sun. And, but it's um, still gonna taste amazing. It tastes like a cucumber. Yeah. And it's fresh. Picking all this produce while it's still fresh takes speed and a gentle touch. I linked up with Mary Bell, a foreman at Inaba Farms, to see how it's done. Is there a specific way that you pull it from the yeah. plant? Yeah, we have to pull it, be careful, because if you pull it hard, we, we took it off this part. Okay. And it's no good. I want to pick this one, is yes. that okay? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, good. that's a good one. Yes. Wow, everyone's up there. So I'm going kind of slow, aren't I? Does she need to pick up the pace a little bit? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Before they got to where they are today, the Yanaba family faced a lot of adversity as they tried to establish roots here in the Yakima Valley. My grandfather Shukichi and his brother Tomoji came from Japan in 1907. At the time they came, 
they couldn't own land. And I think that's why they came to the reservation, because mm -hmm. here they could lease land. You know, with the help of their neighbors and tribal landlords, they farmed like my grandmother would say, like a mole under the ground. And during World War II, they were interned at Heart Mountain, Wyoming. After the war, they returned to the Yakima Valley Reservation where Lon's father took over and the farm began to expand over the years. My grandfather focused on quality, my dad focused on quality, and he decided he couldn't just be a farmer. He had to become a packer and a shipper. Today, Lon oversees 1,500 acres of farmed land and packages and ships his produce to markets throughout the Pacific Northwest and even Canada. With so much work to be done, Lon depends on a hard-working team of laborers to get him through the season. We employ about 200 and something people in the peak season. Typically, our guys will work when we start planting and working in the fields through the frost. Some of them have been with us for, you know, 30 years. Really? After a long day of working in the sun, there's nothing like a place to kick up your feet and relax. For many workers at Inaba Farms, that place isn't too far away. This is our farm worker housing. We have five bedrooms in each unit, two bathrooms. We have a kitchen facility, a dining facility. And I hear air conditioners going. Oh yeah. That's gotta make oh, yeah. them feel good. You know, if the guys can comfortably rest mm -hmm. and, and feel secure, when they come to work the next morning, they're good workers too. Exactly. Although Inaba Farms works with markets throughout the region, local support is still incredibly important to keep farming sustainable. If you push for local when local is in season, then you'll help the growers to recover a, a greater portion of their crop. Yeah. And so you're helping not just the growers, but you're helping the workers. Yeah, because you are supporting the community as well. Local has the best chance mm -hmm. to get the freshest, most nutritious stuff to the consumer. We really depend on the local market. Hey, let's go. I love dumplings, or momos. And when I heard that I was gonna get the chance to try Himalayan dumplings filled with local ingredients, how could I say no? Okay. All right, Anil, I am excited because, you know, I don't really have dumplings a lot in my life. Oh man, you're, you're, you're missing out on having a good full <laughs> life. Although their dumplings are undoubtedly delicious, pronouncing their name isn't easy. It is Kathmandu Momo Cha. Okay. And more specifically, if you're just going to refer to the actual dumplings themselves, those are just momos. Momos? Yeah, oh, keep, okay. it, keep it real simple. <laughs> we partner with a lot of local farms to get our vegetables. And so making sure that we have fresh, never frozen vegetables is key to making sure our vegan dumplings are perfect. These look adorable. Oh man, <laughs> not only are they adorable, they are also so tasty. Awesome. All right, so I'm just gonna cheers. pop this whole thing in my mouth. Does that work? That's okay, okay. That cheers. Right. Mm. How did you swallow that so fast? You know, <laughs> when you grow up as a, Nepa as a Nepalese boy, you can sit down and eat 30 or 40 of these in one sitting. That so. took me like 30 minutes to swallow. This guy's already talking. Oh man, I was already ready for the next one already. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much for having us here. Yeah, today. absolutely. These Thank you. Great. Let's see what everyone else thinks about these little vegan momos. Get that sauce. Mmm, very tasty. It's actually good. But it looks really, really good and it tastes <laughs> equally as delicious. I would say it's like a lot more flavorful than other dumplings. Even though it's vegan, you don't miss anything? <laughs> she takes her second bite. <laughs> it tastes really fresh though. No, it's really original, it's cool. So you'd have no problem having your friends come and try these out? Oh, not at all. I'd definitely do that. <laughs> I got you. Coming up, I'm making green curry with Mama Jeannie at Tabali Asian Bistro. That's your morning workout, Chris. Yeah, I'm already breaking a sweat. <laughs> And we're in the kitchen at Second Harvest trying out some Asian coleslaw. We're back at Dibali Asian Bistro in Airway Heights. This little gem on Highway 2 is serving up incredible Southeast Asian cuisine straight from the heart. There's something really like it in Spokane or the Airway Heights area. It's a lot of food, so I'm glad we shared. There's nothing bad on the menu, it's delicious. I'm third generation of a restaurant owner. Wow. Owner Mama Jeannie spends her time making sure the food is delicious and authentic. She makes sure every guest feels welcome and wanted. 
Kitchen is my happy places, and it was bring with a lot of great childhood memories. So you cooked with your family growing up? Did you cook with your mom? Yes, most of the time she's yelling at me like, you know, why you're not clean after this one? Your season is not right. Like, you know, what is a funny thing for about most of the Asian mom? They don't have a recipe. They always say, oh, you need to pinch this one, pinch that one. Mom, how am I supposed to know this? You need to figure it out. That's what they say. Figure it out. <laughs> yeah, she's a wonderful cook. Well, a lot of people say that about you. <laughs> Thank you're you. You're a wonderful cook. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's I got learning from the, my family, I think. <laughs> yeah, you can deny the gene. Definitely homemade, homegrown, just really unique yeah. ingredients. It's delicious. And the smells just make you hungry. Washington have wonderful four season as like my home country. So I can find all the ingredients very easily in here. Especially I loved using for the Walla Walla sweet onion. They are wonderful product. Yakima, zucchini, sweet corn, and uh, peppers. Well, what are we going to make today? We're going to be make for the homemade green curry. Well, are you hungry? I'm hungry. I am. <laughs> I'm always hungry. I'm always hungry. <laughs> We're gonna be make some green curry. Yes, it is. So first of all, lemongrass you can buy at the store like this kind of way. We're gonna be having Christy. Can you having the okay a little dices? While I chop the lemongrass, Mama Jeannie deseeds the chilies. Then I chop up some blue ginger. So we're gonna be having to the. Uh, pounding in here, oh, so okay. small sizes so smaller, as the the possible. Better. Yes. Yeah. Next, we move on to chopping some fresh turmeric and onions. A lot of fresh ingredients. Yeah, that's a good thing for about the home cooking's beauty because you can uh, control for your ingredient. Then we toast some cumin and coriander seeds. As like a popcorn, yeah. like a pops and. Uh, Tastes a lot better. And, and once you smell it, right, then it's kind of yes. done. Yeah, they're going to be a knock on your doors. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> once you hear them popping, it's time to take them off the heat. Then it's time for pounding. We start by adding the lemongrass, turmeric, blue ginger, chilies, and onion to the mortar. Then we start pounding. That's your morning workout, Christian. Yeah, I'm already breaking a sweat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you want to show me how it's really done? No, it's not. <laughs> Go get it, Mama Jeannie. Try my best. <laughs> We're almost there. After a little while, we add the seeds. Then, after a bit longer, we add some Thai basil and cilantro. Then we add in the garlic and keep pounding. Uh-oh. Chili in her eyes. It's okay. <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> Maybe it's good luck if you get yeah, I think curry so too. in your eye. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, we add some shrimp paste fish sauce, mix it all up, and the curry paste is ready. Now it's time to make the final dish. We start by adding a little coconut milk, which we boil for about 30 seconds. Then we add the curry paste and chicken thighs. Meanwhile, I cut up some Yakima zucchini. Next, we add some onions, carrots, and bone broth stock. After a little while, we add the rest of the coconut milk, some kefir lime leaves, sugar, and fish sauce. After letting it cook for 15 minutes, we add some green beans, red peppers, zucchini, and finish it all off with a little Thai basil. It's good. That is really creamy. I love all the vegetables. Mm. So good. Good job, Christy. Different flavors. The zucchini is amazing. Yes. Delicious. Thank you so much. You're welcome. For more restaurants, recipes, farms, and fun, visit wagrone.com. Washington farms grow incredible foods, but how do they impact their communities? We spoke with Madison Moore, an ag economist with the WSDA, to find out. Agriculture itself provides a baseline for rural communities. What they bring in is not only employment on farms, but also employment in support industries like fertilizer, supplies, and then industries like processing, uh, potato processing in the Tri-Cities, that's a huge industry. So prior to the 80s, it was like three to four people lived in rural areas compared to urban areas. And nowadays it's flipped and it's about twice as many people live in urban areas and rural areas. And so what we get from that is that a lot of people are becoming more separated from agriculture. And so there's a lot less people producing what happens then is kind of a hollowing out of middle America. You know, you don't have people as connected to the rural lifestyle and the rural communities. And the problem with that is that those rural communities aren't as healthy. Yeah. They don't have as vibrant of a support system. And they also don't have the workers to support that system. Washington farms produce dozens of different crops and water is critical to supporting that diversity. 
You know, we're really in a unique situation because Washington State itself is blessed with abundant surface water. That's the reason why we are an agricultural powerhouse. <laughs> we're essentially a desert over here in eastern Washington. Western Washington's different. Dry land crops, which primarily here in Washington, it's wheat. It is valuable per acre, but it's in the hundreds of dollars. When you start jumping into irrigated production, it's thousands of dollars. And from there stems value-added products, packing sheds and processing and exports. So water itself is a conduit to value. In Washington, we love farms of all sizes, and each one has their own role to play in the agricultural economic system. Nobody likes to see small farms going out of business, but in reality, we have seen an upward trends of small farms. That does have a positive impact on communities. Consolidating itself also might have a positive impact, it's hard to say, because when you get a large farm, they also are the ones that are usually vertically integrated. They bring in employment in sectors outside of farming. And when you have just a bunch of small farms, that's not necessarily the case because the families are the ones working on the farms. <laughs> We're really encouraging these days that you think of agriculture as food systems. So large farms, small farms, we need both of them. Consolidation is a natural occurrence, but there eventually will be a balance. Coming up, Val's visiting a fruit processing equipment manufacturer to see how they've built a collaborative relationship with berry growers. If there's an issue or there's a problem or there's something that can be solved and, you know, Angar, our team, can come up with a solution, I'd love to do it. It's a lot of fun. If you're looking for a way to support a local farmer, look no further than a CSA. CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture, and it's a subscription box that you purchase directly through Local Farm. The benefit for the farmer is that they get money up front at the beginning of the season so that they can purchase things for the length of the season, like seeds or infrastructure that they need to grow their best. The benefit for you is that you get to directly support a farmer and you're also eating seasonally. Usually the subscription lasts for about 20 weeks, but it varies from farm to farm. So you'll experience everything from spring through summer and into fall. So right now it's spring on my farm. We're rolling into June. In my CSA box, I'll have spring greens, I'll have radishes, I'll have turnips, I'll have all sorts of tasty spring things, maybe some pea shoots. And as the season progresses, that will change. So the benefit for you is that you'll get the most fresh, most seasonal produce in your box. So with my CSA, I harvest it the morning that folks pick it up. They get to come out to my farm, they get to meet me, we get to know each other over the course of the season, they get to take home the most fresh, seasonal produce available and enjoy it with their families at home. Up in Whatcom County, near Bellingham, you can find some world-famous berries. Andy Enfield is the co-CEO of Enfield Farms, where they're growing these delicious red raspberries for the frozen food aisle. Raspberries, do you love them, you hate them? What's your favorite I way to I love them. I enjoy them all different ways, uh, right off the bush. I enjoy them frozen, any way you can think of. Any way you can think of, right. In order to process his berries, Andy works with Angar Food Processing to design and manufacture equipment for his facility. We do strawberries, blackberries. We work in the, the fishing industries, a uh, little bit in the carrots. Dean Vanderhoek is the design and technical supervisor for Angar. He works with clients like Enfield Farms to design equipment that solves particular problems. If we get a call and a customer has an idea or a piece of equipment, we start, you know, visit this processing plant and go take a look and see if we can help them out. Well, we've been working with Angar for as long as I can remember, probably 30 years. They help us a lot in the processing plant, coming up with solutions to challenges or problems that we have. It's difficult to get workers, so some of the equipment that we build helps them out. They've helped us reduce labor, take out some of the jobs that require a lot of heavy lifting and manual labor. They're able to process more berries per hour with less labor and a lot easier on the individual that's working for them. Now, Andy's taking me through his processing facility where they're taking fresh raspberries and quick freezing them. You've brought me to where it all begins. So tell me about it. What are we looking at? We're uh, right in front of the max cooler. We'll go through here, try to get that field heat out because the fruit's going to be at ambient temperature. So if it's 80 degrees, the fruit's going to be about 80 degrees. We got to get it cooled down fast. 
The fruit comes in from the fields on flats that are stacked, emptied, then washed in systems designed by Angar. Angar built, built these dumpers with the crane where we're grabbing a whole stack of berries. Prior to this setup, we were dumping everything by hand. The berries then get scanned and move on to be cleaned. Wow! Yeah, they go under a magnet, we go through an air cleaner, and then onto a sorter. What's in here? This is, a, this is an IQF tunnel. Oh! So we're, we're freezing the berries in here. Okay. So what would happen if you didn't have Angar in this process with you? I don't know. I don't like to think about that. <laughs> we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing without Angar. The growers around here in Processor have been great to work with. A lot of times, I, if I have an idea, then we kind of go back and forth and come up with something. Sounds like it's a true collaboration. It is. We couldn't really do what we're doing if we're not in this area. This area is absolutely great for growing raspberries. It's a fantastic climate. We got the sandy loam soils and we got the maritime climate, so cool nights, warm days. We love raspberries and uh, we try to grow the best raspberries we can and it feels good to give them to people and, and see them enjoy them. If there's an issue or there's a problem or there's something that can be solved and you know Angar our team can come up with a solution, um, I'd love to do it. It's a lot of fun. Well, we are here in the kitchen at Second Harvest in Spokane and we're here to taste some great recipes from you guys and my tasting partners. I have Tomas over here and I have Chef Laurent over here. Thanks for being here. Well, good to yeah, see you Yeah, we appreciate it's, it's good it. good to be here. Uh, today we get to eat some Asian coleslaw, so that'll be good. But we want to talk a little bit about Second Harvest, and we love coming here and, and working with our partners at Second Harvest, and we appreciate just all of the hard work that they do to feed the people who really need it. Right. And it's not just the holidays, too, that you should be thinking about Second Harvest. You could help all year round, because uh, there's always people that are going to need a little extra help. If you have free time, you can volunteer here uh, as a... Uh, you know, packing food and um, making your, your, your share of, uh, of goodwill. And you can get involved in Second Harvest and help out. You can become a monthly donor. You can uh, make a one-time gift. You can volunteer, uh, just like Laurent said. So uh, we're very happy to be here. And uh, in this episode, we're talking a lot about our fresh vegetables. And, you know, we wouldn't have those vegetables in our grocery stores if it weren't for the farm workers. And we've really got a chance to, to meet a lot of the workers uh, this season and just hang out with them and hear their stories and, and work with them in the fields. It, it is tough. Work. It's backbreaking, and you know, you want to when you go to the grocery store and you look at the produce section. There's a lot of work that goes into that, and I, if anything that this show hopefully does, it shows you how hard it is to get that food to our plate. Absolutely. So we we thank all of those workers. So today we are going to taste some Asian coleslaw by Rit Chesky, and I can't wait. Let's see how it's made.
taste it. It smells Ooh, yep. amazing. And like, looks really beautiful. fresh. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> like, uh, I'm ready for a backyard barbecue, <laughs> right? I mm. love the peanut butter flavor in it. You could almost add some peanuts for the texture, yeah, some, something crunchy in it. Yeah. It'd yeah. be very good. But yeah, so the peanut butter in the dressing is kind of the, the secret mm -hmm. to this salad. One commenter says, uh, that they added dry ramen noodles on the top. So you mentioned mm. the crunch. You know, Texture, you could do the yeah. peanuts or, mm -hmm. in this case, uh, dry ramen noodles. Um, and then they say, I ran the ginger through my garlic press, so I got the ginger flavor, but not necessarily the pieces. You could, if you want also to make it a little more spicy, you could right. put some fresh uh, peppers, even fresh jalapenos, or even some chili flakes oh, in, yeah. the, in the dressing. Right. It's super light, flavorful. Crunchy, Very, yep. Yummy. Refreshing, perfect for a cold slow in, yeah. in the summer. You get your vegetables. Something fixed. to cool you off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that is Asian coleslaw by Rich Chesky, and this is from allrecipes.com. You can find it on our website at wagrown.com. Washington farmers are always working hard for you and me by supporting small businesses, schools, and research. That's it for this episode of Washington Grown. We'll see you next time.